Today, I am going to show you how to make a simple city for your fantasy RPG. I was making one a bit earlier, and I thought to myself, like, ah, there are some new people who would probably appreciate seeing one made, going over everything. And if you're not new, well, perhaps there's some ideas you can steal. Although you can still do that if you're new. I recommend you do that. In fact, steal this city if you want to. I don't care. So with that, let's get into talking about it. So the main reason why I'm doing this is because I'm actually going to run a game for some of my coworkers because they all haven't played D&D &D and they want to. There are D&D &D players everywhere. You just got to seek them out, man. But uh, I made this mega dungeon a while ago. And my sensibilities have changed a little bit, so I'm going to retool a lot of the stuff in it. But along with that, I want to redo the town I made for it because it's a little sloppy. Now, a town is important because it breathes a different kind of life into the game, a different kind of fun for the players. All social, so to speak. All social interactions. Outside of the dungeon, which will have some social interactions, but mostly dungeon crawling. But with that, it's not that difficult to make a living town that's memorable and interesting and easy on you to create because for beginners it can seem very intimidating. So let's start off with some basic ideas for this. What we focus on making at first is everywhere that the PCs, player characters, are very likely to visit and that's going to be informed by the climate and a few other just static factors. Oh, and also, I made it in this neat little notebook. It's all meant to be pocket-sized. That was the whole kind of theme with this Mega Dungeon. I could put it into my pocket and take it with me places. It's neat. However, carrying all the minis means that it's not pocket-sized anymore. Or I guess it never would have been. Oh, well, it's cute theming anyway. Now, Rotiart. Established after an army of the light broke. Its Klingons settled in the rich alpine terrain. So, basic tooling there. We're in alpine terrain, so just about two and a half seasons out of the year, it's bitter cold and awful, and then the other one-ish, it's all nice and sunny and lush and wonderful. So this really tells us how houses are going to be designed, how people are generally going to act, what they'll eat. I kind of think of the Nords from Morrowind, kind of. Something similar to that. Along with that, too, established after an army of the light broke. And maybe broke wasn't the right word after they were successful in all their Klingons, because, you know, a lot of people follow an army due to how much money can be made, whether they're clothing washers, cooks, general help, blacksmiths. There are a whole bunch of different people that follow an army because the army needs that support. So the people of this town, their great-great-great-grandfathers, were either soldiers in this army or were in some way civilian help with it. And that can inform a lot of beliefs. A lot of people still probably have great grandpappy's armor, shield, and rusty sword up in their attic. And they're probably more than willing to use it. In this case, because they were successful, I would say that people are very proud of that fact. They remember it. There's probably a few holidays actually just built around the fact that their army was successful in the past at containing the evil powers of chaos. Something you can play off of more in the future. Along with that too, this is part of Bismarck. Now this is kind of like fantasy Germany. This is a country in my world. Now, I won't go into details about Bismarck here. If people actually want me to talk about my D&D world, oh, I will gladly make videos on it. The rough population of this town city, I guess it leans more towards city. So 1,370-ish people, give or take. Exports. So, the environment plays a part of this alpine terrain. Stone, wood, and furs. For stone, I figure there are some quarries that are operating half the year, roughly, here. Wood, well, you can generate wood. There are logging operations all year round. And furs. Now, we'll get into this a bit later, but there are different kinds of creatures that are hunted at different times of the year. Specifically here, foxes, martens, and beavers. All furs that nobles would very much like. But what does the town want? Well, it wants wine, and it wants iron. And I've made a note here, the iron mined in this area is exceptionally poor. So that informs a lot of things, too. So normally, I would say a blacksmith is kind of a essential, quote-unquote, part of any fantasy city. However, in this case, it's really hard for a blacksmith to exist. So I'm just saying that they have to import all of their iron tools, metal tools, all that kind of stuff. 
And as for wine, well, people like wine, and that applies to all drinks pretty much. Now, what does that mean, though, for the PCs? Well, in the dungeon, if they happen to find an exceptionally ancient vintage of wine, or they find some amazing metal tools, well, they can sell that for a fair bit of gold, because that's needed in the town. Uh -huh, see? And so we also make sure to put those kinds of things in the dungeon for them to try to bring out. Well, continuing on from here, a quick look at this Castle Bastos. Now, admittedly, this wasn't something I really had to work on right now. However, I, I wanted to for myself. So we know who the Baronet is, Sir Gabriel Bastos. We know who his wife is. And we have a basic breakdown of what they both look like. And this can be kind of big, because people tend to copy their lords and ladies. The style of mustache here is very common, it's static, but because the lord has it, a lot more people are going to have it despite it being a cultural thing. And that's two long mustaches hanging down like walrus fangs. Now for the life of me, I can't remember what this mustache style is actually called, but that is the look. Oh yeah, so in my world I have a thing called Divine Blessings and Talents. It's a little complicated, but... Talents are kind of genetic, and for the Baronet's wife, I rolled a talent spell copy. Now, one of my players has that exact same talent in a completely different game, and he is the son, I think the seventh, the seventh son of a noble lord? I determined that the Bastos family was related to his, uh, the Neuvern family. I also determined here that Castle Bastos and its inhabitants have ruled over this city for just about four generations. That might be important later, but right now it's not particularly. Uh, from here I just have some general information who the Castellan is, just in case there's a big fight ever. And something a little more interesting, the court magician, Willbad. Now, I describe him here as a fox-like man, small, gnarled hands, robes that are way too large for him, a little creepy dude. He's going to be walking around the town a little bit. You know, he's going to be doing his thing. PCs might bump into him. That could be important. But I haven't determined his feelings on some things. So perhaps in the future he could be a good villain or a good ally. Who can say? And that's a big thing with making a town or a city like this. Leaving in characters that you don't have a plan for can be really helpful in actually making story later on. Because like I said, Wilbad can be anything I need him to be. A surprisingly nice character, despite his, you know, kind of foxy, gnarled hands, kind of creepy look. Or, of course, a kind of stereotypical bad guy, if I really need one. Uh, from here, we have someone more important, though, than the Castellan, the Bailiff. He kind of acts as a mayor for this town. People go to him with problems, and he generally sorts them out. So I have him here as a level 4 thief catcher, which is basically a thief, but, you know, they catch thieves so they can be lawful. And, uh, yeah, he's pretty cool. There's just about 60 guards here to help him out, which, that's part of it, too. So normally I wouldn't have so many guards. There are, what, I think 30 elite guards and 30 more guards within the actual bastion itself. But along with that, too, 60 guards in the outer part. Well, considering that, you know, these people have a heritage in the army, of course they'd want to, you know, take up arms and help defend this city. Kind of, you know, I, a bit of storytelling there. Perhaps it's something I can work on later to make it, you know, sound a little better. Just some ideas right now, because the game actually hasn't even started yet. Oh, along with that too, I have the Guard Captain Felix, level 4 fighter. Alright, now this is something generally static, hopefully, for most towns, and that is an inn of some kind. Right here we have the Blue Cat Inn. I describe it very briefly. I have the general description of the first floor. Uh, but more importantly, I have the owner. So Neil, a fat man, black hair, large nose, mustache, two walrus-like tusks, and small eyes. And then we have a bit of information about him here. Along with that, we have who's working for him. He's also fat. Never trust a skinny innkeeper. That's a bit of advice. Oh, okay, this is interesting. So, how much food's gonna cost? Well, anywhere from five copper pieces to one gold piece. Pretty big range. And next to that, I have some parentheses, veggies, meats, soups, and spiced heavily. That spice being the big thing. On a cold climate, people would probably value spicy. Any, anything warm, so soups also along with that, emphasizing that. You know, think of things daily, what they would eat. Give players a decent description of it. Just some words to help jog the idea process. Oh yeah, we also have a stable on the back. Two stable boys, one silver pieces for one day for, you know, stabling a horse or a mule. If that ever comes up. We also have a second inn. I think this city is big enough for it, the Blue Rose Inn. 
However, this is kind of the the evil end. The owner Rodius is thin, clean shaven. He's kind of rat like, you know, level two thief. He's a schemer. He has two <laughs> he has two burly guards and a sad flute player, along with his serving wenches, in his establishment. So the thing with him is, it's cheaper to generally eat and sleep there. However, you know, the furniture's rickety, it's kind of awful, and the food, you know, the drinks are watered down and the food kind of stinks, they're not spiced. However, he will overlook any crime that's going on. And along with that too, he might make some crime for himself, you know, stealing from the players or agging them on, trying to get them arrested, who can say? So yeah, this is the cheaper option, but it's the more dangerous option. Next, now this is the more old school option here. This is important because in my game, one gold piece equals one experience point. So gems that are worth 250 gold, 250 experience points. But now you have a gem and you want to liquidate that into cash. Well, you need a money changer. So, you know, he has some glass cases with some gold and gem finery. He has guards, two level three fighters as hired guards, along with that two war dogs that are, you know, super loud. Maybe a little more bark than they are bite, but that's important. All Fiddlebert Milub needs, a level 3 thief of course, you know, weasel like old man, with a fine green coat, to defend his establishment. And of course, he's not going to buy things for full price, you know. If you want to turn big coins into smaller coins or just pure metal, like gold chunks or platinum chunks into, you know, their respective currency, he's going to take 10% of whatever value you're taking. So, you know, for every 10 gold pieces, he'll take one of them to turn that into 90 silver. Gems and finery, you can, you know, it'll be a bit of haggling, but he'll buy it for 50% to 80% of its actual value. And of course, mark it up and sell it for 102% to 120% of its actual value. And along with that too, he'll store valuables for just about a year. He'll just take 10% of however much gold you're putting in however much wealth you're putting in, you know, for himself as a kind of safeguarding fee. And he will legitimately store it. He won't steal it. And it will be safe so long as it's with him. Maybe if the story demands it, it gets stolen. But I'm thinking that Fiddlebert here is actually, you know, despite his looks, a pretty honest guy in that regard. You know, he has a business and he wants it to stay legitimate because he makes a lot of money from it. And it's definitely more profitable. And it's definitely more profitable keep the party who's bringing in all these gems and jewels and golden plates on his side because he makes a lot of money from that. Once again, money. Ah yes, another big one, the Axis Church. Now in my world, the Axis Church, it's its own separate entity, kind of like the Vatican, except with a lot more land and a lot more influence in every country. Well, I guess it depends on the city itself too. Generally, they have a lot of power and officially they're neutral, so they're everywhere. But they have a very nice stone building, stained glass, you know, small graveyard. They have their patron saints, Balthazar and Brainerd. And importantly, we have the three big clergy members of this particular Church of Axis. So we have Father Randis, who's a level 7 cleric. As you see here, I have a little thing, Macho Man. So this kind of, in the parentheses, informs me of what voice I want to do for them. From here to there to everywhere, I, the macho man, Randy Savage, do lurk. Praise be to Axis, all glory to Axis, oh yeah. You know, the general mannerisms, what they want. Uh, we have Father Mark, which I have labeled as Southern Baptist. And on the fifth day, they did say, the Crusaders of Axis did come down upon the foul undead menace and did slay them with their holy swords and shields and horses. Can I get an amen for that, folks? Amen. Amen. Um, <laughs> and then Father Gurn, Irish. Axis has blessed us all in different ways. However, uh, you seem to be lacking in blessings. Despite that, uh, my son, we will find a place for you. After all, Axis has a place for us all, don't she? Uh, I have a note here, so free lodging and food for the clergy. It pays to be a cleric or a crusader of Axis, because you don't have to pay for an inn, and you're safe, and you can store your stuff there. Along with that too, I had an idea where you could buy mobile shrines and place them in dungeons, and by burning different color candles at them, you get a bonus for like one battle or one dungeon exploration. I think it's neat, I want to play around with it more, but the Axis church here will sell these mobile shrines. Very good for a mega dungeon for creating like little restrooms. I also have a bunch of things the Axis Church will sell. You know, you never know when the players might want these. Right, here we have a carter. So, basic information, he's a man that will ferry goods to and from the dungeon, along with men, uh, big objects, whatever else. 
way cheaper than actually buying a horse and mule and stabling them just to, you know, hire the carter for a day or two. Ravenwood Supply, so this is the general store. Basic information, the owner is Tomatis, Ravenwood. Now the Ravenwood, they're big traders in my game, some of them are noble lords, and that's how they get their connections everywhere. And due to good relationships with the church, they're allowed to open here, despite them operating out of Bismarth's rival country, Rulix. But in any case, uh, Mr. Ravenwood is off and away, or I guess it would be Sir Ravenwood. So instead, he has two other guys to watch his store. Ranos Dahl, who is a thief, a level 6 thief, so he's no joke, operates the store, and Gormag, who is a hired assassin to act as the muscle. Because, you know, if you see someone steal from you, you just note down what they look like and send an assassin in to not only recover the goods, but to, you know, kill them. Leave a, leave a bit of a message, you know? Don't rob us. Or if things really get out of hand, I also have noted down later that there is a plus one longsword hidden underneath the counter. But, uh, yeah, no, they operate a legitimate business here, despite them being thieves and assassins. But they will retaliate if anyone is stupid enough to rob them. Along with that, too. So I generally make my store so there is only, like, the store counter and then a ledger with all the items written down and how much they have in stock. Because people kind of wised up that, you know, stuff's gonna get nicked and stolen if they leave it out in the open. And that's not good for business. So obviously it's all in the back. Now, there might be a few stores that keep all their wares up front, but in general, I don't think people are stupid. I think that these guys would really want to protect their investments, so they'll just send one of the serving boys they have to go run and get you your stuff, whatever list they're given of all the things that you've already paid for. And then you'll either meet them out back, or they'll hand you it over the counter. So then from there, we have basic information, a lot less than the previous things. So we have the Trapper's Guild, because, you know, trapping is a big way this town, city, makes money. We have the guild master's name, we have a little bit about him, but more importantly, we have how much they buy different pelts for. So foxes, beavers, and martens. And also, when they trap them, actually. Next, we have the stonecutters slash the mason's guild. Uh, we know their guild master, Tomar. Interestingly enough, I decided he was a dwarf from the Iron Hills, which I, I don't do. My world is very uh, humanocentric. So that's an actually interesting focal point. He is the only dwarf in this entire city, so he's a character, he's well known. And obviously he is very proficient in making high quality stone tools. We have the Loggers Guild. I don't have a lot in them because I really don't know if the PCs will visit them, but I know Master Lewis is the guild master, just in case that ever comes up. Along with that too, I do have the nicer houses noted down having this dark wood. I figure maybe an ebony-like tree is around here, you know, that dark wood. I know they're tropical, but maybe there's some kind of winter variant that only grows around here. And, uh, yeah, that's all the basic stuff I prepared for the first session. We'll see what they're more interested in as time goes on, and then I'll add to that notebook depending on where their interests, you know, swivel. I do know I want to make a scholar in the town who, maybe if they gift him a few books, he's more open to tell them some lore, little things like that, but for now, this is good enough. But, uh, yeah, as I hope you can see, there are a lot of good plot threads here and there and everywhere in that, too. Uh, why is the merchant away all the time? How did he get this assassin at the Blue Rose? Is it a front? Is there something shady going on? Who can really say? The money changer, maybe he will get robbed. That's an interesting plot thread where the PCs will be a little pissed off and go get revenge and their stuff back. Lots of lots of little details like that. And also, I, and I also passed over a lot of the descriptions of the NPCs, but depending on like their beard style, you can kind of tell where they're from. Look, there's lots of little things you can do with this to really breathe life into the game. But uh, yeah, with that, preparation is important. Hopefully this gave you an idea of some things to have in a town. I'll really quickly list off those static things. I think an inn, a general store, and a blacksmith are the things the PCs will visit the most, so they're important to have a bit of, a decent bit of information on. But, uh, yeah, jeepers. Well, with that, I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, thank you for sticking around. I know it was a little rambly. Oh! And before I forget, we have a Discord server, so if you want to come in and chat me up about D&D, we do a voice call about once a week. But with that... Thank you all for watching, and I hope to see you all in the next video.